our habit rather than making statements we'll go right to questions if everyone got their recorders in place and cameras on etc okay let's start Becky you're first Becky Bohr with the Associated Press one thing I've heard from a number of legislators this session is a desire to restore the public trust on the dividend because of what happened with the governor and then last year um, there's a lot of rhetoric in the governor's race, um, you know, not inside this building about the dividend. You had two House leaders stand up on the floor on Friday and argue for a full dividend for this year. And I'm wondering, you know, and we heard Senator Hoffman's comments here last week about what a full dividend would mean. So I'm wondering how do you go about rebuilding the public trust on the dividend if the messages are you know, so muddled or mixed? Sure. Well, one thing I think that's happened is that the the discussion over the dividend has gone far afield of our desire to stabilize it. <clears throat> we see the market go up, we see the market go down, and under the current uh, formulation for the dividend, uh, it makes it very susceptible to market shifts. And so our desire is to stabilize the dividend so that people can depend on it for a long term and it can be generational rather than sitting out there um, waiting to get uh, reduced dr dramatically from a market shift. Senator Pachee? Well, anything that's being discussed is not about reducing the dividend, it's about stabilizing it over time. I mean, that was the governor's plan when he talked about the potential use of earnings reserve dollars and we had a $4 billion budget deficit. Um, I'm not speaking for the governor, but I mean, that was my understanding and that is my understanding about a plan going forward. And remember the dividend was 800 and something dollars, I think four years ago. Our plan is about you know, shaving off the peaks and filling in the valleys of not only funding requests for UGF spend, but also for the best use of our long-term financial assets. I think last year I made, or last week, I made mention of the $100,000 that we in that account, in the permanent fund dividend account, uh, that was down to $100,000 at one time because this formulation is, uh, it, it's not a good formula to stabilize the dividend. You're always gonna have these big shifts, big peaks and valleys. If I could, Mr. President, Alaska expects their legislature to come together and to pull people together with a unified message. And I think that that's beginning. Uh, as far as I know, both the House the Senate and the administration agree that we have to move together towards a percent of market value. Right now, uh, you've heard others at this table this morning talk about uh, the unpredictability of uh, currently our income our revenue coming into our state. And, and so as we come together around ideas, I think that we can build the public trust in that this, this isn't a surprise. We have been talking about this for five years. We have tried to explain that there is a disconnect between the earnings from the permanent fund and the health of our economy and the businesses that uh, work here that employ uh, my neighbors, that employ uh, people in my neighborhoods. And so as we talk about the percent of market value, the dividend question becomes more important than ever in that a, a major percentage of that under the current formula would be paid out in dividend and not deploying services into communities that are uh, dry of those services that are looking for ways that their state can actually hold up uh, what is happening in local communities. And so we are trying to, uh, as uh, my president, as my majority leader have said, try to pull people together to say, this isn't the government's money. This isn't just an individual's money. This is the people's money. We are a shared state and the oil revenues that have been deposited into Alaska's permanent fund are there both for this generation and the next. Rich, or, go, uh, go ahead. Can I just tie in the spending limit on that? The, the reason why, uh, one of the primary reasons why the um, Senate pushed for a spending limit again, and this was on the floor so it should be available to you, was the $15 billion that was spent that had it been, this been in place since around 99, we would have not been in a position we're in. I mean, we, we simply have to, and it's based on a reasonable amount. We, we had the base at 4.1 billion, which is a little more than what we spent last year. Um, and it's, it's based on actual costs of doing business in Alaska, Anchorage CPI. But those billions in place would have meant the governor would have never reduced the dividend. We'd be in a very different position today. We would have 
a substantial amount of savings left. So it's discipline that we plan to put in place and hopefully get a constitutional amendment to, to repair the limit that's in the Constitution today so that we can manage these fluctuations in revenue and, and avoid the fluctuations in spending. Rich? Yeah. Um, Rich Mauer, Channel 2 News. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it looks like the House, the Senate Finance Committee is holding uh, here public hearings on the measure on the, on the operating budget this week. That's before you've changed it in any way. Is that is it appropriate to hold public hearings on a, on a, on a bill that... Uh, Rich, uh, we were a anticipating the arrival of the budget for the last two weeks, so we have been in close communication with our counterparts over in the House, and it was our understanding that on Friday, at the latest, we would receive the operating budget. So obviously, we will have to change our schedule. It is not my intent to move forward in scheduling a bill that's not in our possession. But you know, it begs the question, if we were going to get done in 90 days, we needed to have the budget here uh, in the Senate. We're on day 70. We have 20 days left to meet that deadline. And now little hope that we can adequately review the process and allow people to um, comment on whatever the House does as well as how our subcommittees close out. So I think that we'll have to revise our schedule. Um, it, it, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, you know, the House is working very hard to uh, have a conversation about a very difficult subject, and that is uh, the size of the dividend. We understand that. Uh, we hope that uh, cooler heads will prevail and that we will focus on 26 and the percent of market value and establishing a dividend long term or other vehicles that are out there. But inside the operating budget, it makes it uh, very hard for people to explore um, the consequences of all the decisions that they're bringing forward on the floor. Madam yeah. Chair, sure. can I just finish or dovetail? I didn't see any of you at the 7 a.m. DPS, Department of Public Safety, close out this morning. Rich, I expected to see you there, but um, I was very uncomfortable closing out that subcommittee budget because we don't, we don't know, but in order for us to stay on any kind of a schedule, we'll, we're sort of, I, I closed out with an asterisk that said we're not sure how the House is going to close their budget. We may reopen it to adjust accordingly, so we're doing the best we can with um, their schedule being delayed by a couple of weeks, and we're, we're hoping they can get that across the finish line, and then we can act accordingly. Nat. So wait, wait, wait. Just me follow up. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Does that mean, by revising the schedule, does that mean that you're, go you're not going to have public hearings until you have a final, more or less, more, final, I'm not saying a you product. have a final product, <laughs> a product that you've actually been through? Rich, I haven't seen uh, Senator Hoffman this morning. He's the operating budget chairman. I schedule the bills, and we work together to schedule bills. So this morning's conversation with my staff has been, what are we going to do since we didn't receive the document? If we received it today, we could go forward so the general public could comment if they wanted to on what the House has done, and that would provide uh, additional information for our subcommittees to consider. But it's in flux right now uh, because, as I've said, we thought we were receiving the uh, operating budget last week. Okay. And, and, you know, we had um, originally anticipated that they would send the budget over on the 10th. Uh, that was 16 days ago. Now, they're having issues, and we understand that, uh, that but we anticipated a lot earlier. I, I assumed when they said the 10th that uh, given a few bumps in the road that we'd get it by the 15th, but here is the 26th. We're pretty f getting pretty far behind because they can't, uh, can't move quite fast enough. Uh, Nat? Yeah, Nat hers with <clears throat> the Anchorage Daily News. Um, I guess I just was, I wanted to follow up on that and ask, I mean, I, I know it, it's the House and you guys are the Senate and the House is the House, but um, we've watched them on the floor debating this budget for four days now. I think we watched them in finance for quite a while with many amendments, almost what feels like kind of endless debate. I, I mean, do you guys have any thoughts about like, is there a better way to do that? Um, well, yeah, Nat, that's an interesting point. Um, uh, both uh, 
Senator McKinnon and I go back into a House experience. Right. And um, generally what we would do is on amendment night, we would go through until it got done, no matter what. Uh, I remember one time we started at 10 in the morning, went around the clock till 7.30 the next morning. Uh, we, we cut debate on the amendments at that point, went into third reading at about 10 o'clock. We all went home and showered and got breakfast. And we went to like 8 o'clock at night. The point was we, we knew there was going to be a big, big bump in the road on a certain day, and we were just committed to go through no matter what. I don't, and, and in fairness, I don't know that that's the best thing to do right now because they have a different makeup, a different, a, a different personality over there. And frankly, <laughs> I'm beginning to worry about people's health. Um, this has been two or three years of these, these marathon sessions out on the uh, House floor. Um, they're working very hard, and it's starting to show. Uh, we've had some problems, and uh, some problems that some of you don't even know about. And um, I just uh, I wish them the best of luck. I mean, they, we have to get the process done. They're dealing with a different set of circumstances than we are. Uh, we'll receive it and act quickly on it when, when we get it. Do you think it would be a good idea to maybe limit debate or limit the number of the amendments or maybe think yeah. about some steps to kind of expedite that process? The, the problem with that is those all require bills uh, to change our rules. You probably wouldn't get the requisite number of votes to do that. It's also an issue of freedom of speech. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what would be argued. Uh, you know, a, a minority has a right to present their uh, positions on things, right, uh, when it's relevant to a particular bill. and. Uh, there are bills in committee that allow everyone to express themselves on. And so, uh, you know, it does get to be a, a long time. And a hundred amend amendments seems uh, a little overboard for we, anyone. We had 158 the night I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've sat there until 2 or 3 in the morning. And it gets uh, tedious sometimes to listen to the same amendment come up over and over again. You know, uh, I'll just speak to the health issues that I'm concerned about in the House and, quite frankly, in the entire body. Becky, it goes back to you and looking at the public trust. These are not e easy issues for any of us. Um, we hear from constituents on almost all sides of any particular issue. And for those that uh, care deeply about a particular issue, it's an enormous amount of stress. Uh, certainly in the building, there's high blood pressure and other items that um, people care about their communities, they care about the people that they represent, and they want to do uh, what is in the best interests of people. And so coming together on these issues are difficult. And of those 100 or 158, as the President referred to, there might be an amendment or two that just strikes the right chord and that people want to support and move forward something that someone has thought about that no one else has brought to light during the committee process. And so, you know, I... Uh, I do think people have to prioritize being in Juno uh, to be able to accomplish some of these things, that attendance is imperative, and that when uh, folks are down a few people, so I looked to the House where they had to replace two individuals, and that the Senate had to replace one. Um, you know, that took uh, an incredible amount of time, 30 days, that put them behind. It put us behind in uh, adequate representation for the people that those individuals uh, when those individuals didn't have people in seats in, here in Juneau. So, however, my, my much ni nicer counterparts this morning are being very understanding. At some point, they have to get us a budget. <laughs> and, and if they don't get us a budget at some point, we have to look at different ways. And I'm the kind of new guy here, Nat, but um, at some point, if they struggle long enough, we have to think about breaking the tradition. And I know my two counterparts don't agree with me, um, but... Uh, that's something in the following years we're going to have to talk about. If it remains that tight,